ดีอีกครั้งนะคะสวัสดียามบ่ายยามฝนตกนะคะออขอต้อนรับทุกท่านเข้าสู่งานประชุมในภาคบ่ายของห้องประชุม601นะคะเพื่อให้เป็นไปตามพระราชบัญญัติคุ้มครองข้อมูลส่วนบุคคลพุทธศักราช2562หรือ PDPA ส่วนมนุษย์มีการบันทึกภาพวิดีโอเพื่อใช้เผยแพร่สู่สาธารณะนะคะสำหรับเป็นประโยชน์ในการศึกษาหากท่านใดไม่สะดวกบันทึกภาพและเผยแพร่ภาพดังกล่าวสามารถแจ้งกันวันที่ได้นะคะเพื่อไม่ให้เป็นการเสียเวลาขอเชิญทุกท่านเข้าสู่การประชุมทางวิชาการในหัวข้อ Southern Anthropocene and Polyvisual Ontological Politics นะคะโดยวิทยากรท่านแรก a s u r o m o r i t o ภาควิชามหาภาควิชามนุษยวิทยามหาวิทยาลัยโอซาก้าค่ะท่านที่2 Strip b a l จากภาควิชาการจัดการมหาวิทยาลัย Nottingham t r e n ท่านที่3มายาคอฟสกาคอฟสกายาคณะสังคมศาสตร์มหาวิทยาลัยเชียงใหม่ค่ะท่านที่4 c a s p e r b u r g e n s e n นะคะและร่วมเสวนาและดำเนินรายการโดยรองศาสตราจารย์รองศาสตราจารย์ดรจักรกิจสังคมณีค่ะภาควิชาสังคมวิทยาและมนุษยวิทยาคณะรัฐศาสตร์จุฬาลงกรณ์มหาวิทยาลัยนะคะเรียนเชิญอาจารย์ได้เลยค่ะโอเคบุ๊บโอเคโอเคอืมกูดอัฟเทอร์นูนเอวิวันโซอืมดิสเซชันวิลบีคอนดักเต็ดอืมอินอังกฤษแต่อืมซินส์อืมแอมทายและยูโน่ถ้าคุณยูโน่เลเดอร์ออนถ้าคุณมีคำถามอะไรที่ยังไม่รู้ในทายคุณก็สามารถถามและอ่านแล้วก็จะพยายามอ่านโอเคสำหรับงานประชุมนี้อืมเรา table ทั้งหมดจะมีชื่อว่า Southern Anthropocene and the Pluriversal Ontological Politics Okay, so the idea of having this session um, in this conference um, is uh, we have we actually have the idea of you know like so tackling the idea of Anthropocene uh, a little bit because of course uh, we are all aware that um, the idea of Anthropocene is a Western um, initiated concept you know but applied to the rest of the world. And um, it seems that a lot of people who might not, you know, uh, encounter the same experience with uh, Anthropocene, especially people uh, from the South, the Global South, right? And of course, when we talk about the idea of Global South, uh, it is not only the the, the geographical um, location, but it actually encompass. Uh, Another kind of political connotation, for example, we're talking about unequal power relations uh, among people, right? We talk about uh, ecological, um, economic discrepancy. Um, we talk about, um, you know, um, unequal, you know, uh, epistemological um, uh, authority as well. So uh, the Southern here is actually a very relative term, uh, in the sense that we are talking about. A kind of decolonizing or othering the the Anthropocene, you know. So, uh, the purpose of uh this roundtable is actually to sort of you know engage with the overall theme of the conference, uh, which is the emerging methodologies. Um, but of course, we are not only talking about the methodology per se, but we might also. So trying to uh, relate the idea of Anthropocene and especially the Southern Anthropocene, the Southern method, um, to the epistemological level and um, ontological level as well. So um, uh, what I would like to do today is also um, since we have uh, people here and actually, uh, actually we, you know, um, uh, would like to have Marisol de la Catena with us, but. Uh, because due to the you know, travel constraint and some personal reason, uh, she couldn't be here. Uh, but still, we can have her here, you know, um, uh, in the round table by bringing her contribution uh, and how her works actually inspire and also engage with our own works. Okay, so um, let me start by introducing our panelists first, and then uh, I'll talk about. Um, Marisol's work um, a little bit before we, you know, al allow uh, our uh, speaker to, um, you know, um, present their own um, talk and then uh, how they engage their work with uh, Marisol's um, contribution. So um, next to me here is my uh, long-term friends and and colleague 
um, Asuro Morita. Um, he is a professor of science, technology, and culture at the Osaka University Department of uh, Anthropology. And Asuro has been um, researching on the global knowledge uh, network, on especially on hydrology and water management, you know, in Thailand and other part of the world. Um, uh, recently, he also uh, working on Japanese sustainability movement, right, and uh, their effort to sort of uh, remake or you know um, reconstruct um, different kind of infrastructure and 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 hand on experience with. Uh, Maker Labs. Um, his recent publication include being affected by thinking deltas, changing landscape, resilience, and complex adaptive system in scientific story of Anthropocene, um, and also the world multiple quotidian politics of knowing and generating entangled worlds and infrastructure in social and social complexity, a companion which he called edited with um, Casper Brinjensen and Penny Harvey. Um, the next speaker next to Asuro is um, Steve Brown. Uh, Steve is a professor of health and organization, organizational psychology at Nottingham Trent University in UK. Um, his research service user experience of mental health care and social remembering amongst uh, vulnerable groups and psychological will being a safety. He is also the author and co-author of many books, including Vital Memory and Affect, Psychology Without Foundations, and the Social Psychology of Experience. And then next to um, Steve is um, Kassaro. Uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> I mixed up your name. That's hybrid, right? So that's a good thing. So Casper Brun Jensen. <laughs> sorry, Casper. Okay, he's uh, from the Institute for Science and Society, Nottingham University, and also Casper is also affiliate with um, Jalalongkorn University um, Department of Anthropology as well. Um, Casper is a science and technology studies scholar working on. The, the anthropology of development, anthropology, uh, anthropology of development, infrastructure, and environments. He has published, you know, um, the book called "Monitoring Movements in Development Aid" with Brit, uh, with Rick, and um, he actually edited the book called "Infrastructure and Social Complexity" with Asuro and Penny Harvey. I already mentioned that. And in that book and elsewhere, um, with Asuro, he actually has developed a distinctive take on uh, the ontological turn, which focuses on practical ontology and infrastructure as ontological experiment. Okay. And last but not least, over there um, is Maya uh, Kovskaya from Chiang Mai University Faculty of Social Science. Um, her interests lie in the intersection of political and ecological with the performative, semiotic, and vi uh, in visual and popular culture. And her work takes, on, uh, takes a form of onto-epistemological investigation and current research, including the work on eco-semiosis uh, eco and, uh, uh, and anthropocene, uh, reading anthropogenic trophic cascade as indexical sign of relative multi-species, um, and uh, sustainability, okay? And she also the director of Amor Mundi Multi-Species Ecological World Making Lab in Chiang Mai University. And I myself, uh, Jagrit Sankhamani from uh, Jalalongkorn University um, Anthropology Department. So um, let me start uh, the overall round table by um, introducing the idea that um, Marisol uh, de la Cadena, which is um, uh, an, an anthropologist um, based uh, in the University of California, Davis, uh, has you know been um, working on for the past um, few decades. Um, Marisol de la, de la Cadena um, in herself interested in uh, different issues, including the study of politics, uh, multi-species, uh, indigeneity, history, and the anthropology of worlds. Um, and her works are actually situated um, between, you know, uh, on one hand, STS, um, which is science, technology, and society, and on the other hand, uh, something uh, which is non-STS, for example, like the in indigen uh, indigenous people and uh, like, um, you know, uh, cows and other multi-species uh, ethno ethnography. 
and um, her first book, uh, which is called The Indigenous Metisos, uh, Politics of Race and Culture in Casco, Peru, uh, is a kind of historical and ethnographic um, examination of the racial relation you know, uh, of the people in the Andes. And her um, recent book, uh, which is called Earth Beings, uh, Ecologies of Practice Across and, uh, Andean Worlds, uh, is actually based on her um, lively and engaging conversation with two um, uh, uh, healers uh, uh, in Peru, uh, in Casco in Peru. Um, they are like Quechua uh, people. And um, she actually conduct uh, the so-called partial, uh, uh, the partially connected conversation with these people. And, and what she means is that um, the idea of having you know, conversation. Um, okay, I have to sort of read my notes here. Um, so, um, in in her con uh, conversation with uh, the, the healer, Marisol and her casual friends engage in a considering a kind of life uh, at a conjuncture where, on one hand, the modern politics, which is you know, uh, she consider it as part of the uh, historical development uh, and the mountain, you know, or, uh, but not only. So she called it um, Earth Being, which is a historical kind of being. Um, how these two things, you know, between the politics of uh, indigeneity and the Earth Being actually collide and diverge, you know, and thus uh, uh, surpassing, you know, uh, uh, each other. So the book is an ethnography that focuses on the very idea of incommensurability uh, and uh, what you call the eventfulness of a, uh, a historical. Okay, so her works actually, since we are focusing on the methodology, her works not only talking about ontological opening uh, kind of approach, but also uh, touch upon the very idea of the methodology that we are using in anthropology as well, which is ethnography, right? So um, her work actually questioned the, uh, uh, the, the premise and, and promise that ethnographer you know, uh, you know, um, seem to uh, uh, have the capacity to do, which is to translate between different light worlds. Okay, that you know, even though we are living in the very distinctive, um, different light worlds, but yet we still be able to remain partially connected and have a, a kind of asymmetrical um, connection between each other as well. So um, one of the statements from her book, which I uh, very li uh, like very much, and here I quote, is that our worlds were not necessarily commensurable. But this, is, but this did not mean that we couldn't communicate. Indeed, we could. Insofar as I accept that I was going to leave something behind, as with my translation, or even better, that our mutual understanding was going to be full of gaps that would be different from each of us and would constantly show up interrupting but not preventing our communication. So this is a kind of you know, a partially connected uh, conversation that she has with her uh, casual friends. And I think it's bring us to the idea of uncommoning nature of how we uh, actually conducting our wording um, in our daily life. And so this leads to another work of her, um, uh, which is she called, uh, she proposed the idea of anthropo-not seen, uh, which is, um, has been um, published in the paper called Uncommoning Nature. Um, what is the, the idea of anthropo-not seen? Um, I actually also like quote her um, explanation of the term which is quite complex, so I'll, I'll try to read it uh, slowly. Um, anthropo anthropo-not seen being conceptualized as the world-making process, okay? Um, through which heterogeneous world that do not make themselves through the practice that ontologically separate human and non-human are applied into that distinction and at the same time exceed it. So what it means is that, um, of course, we have ontological division between nature and culture, human and non-human, but there are earth being or other kind of anthropo-not-seen being that sort of not 
fit into that kind of you know division, ontological division or category. But they're not only um, doesn't fit into that kind of category, but it is actually exceeded and trying to um, so overcome that kind of uh, distinction as well. So this is very important um, idea because it actually allow us to talk about the pluriverse or the pluriversal wording um, uh, in another sense. And this is led to her, you know, um, latest um, edited book called um, uh, A World of Many Worlds. So what we are trying to see is that, of course, we are living in the same world, but the world can be, uh, of course, this is a, uh, what, what you call a one world world, which is, you know, we are living in a world, but with different perspective. But in fact, what we're trying to do here, and I think uh, people uh, will try to uh, come up with their own uh, world-making process, is that whether it is possible for us to actually um, living together in a world where many worlds would fit. Okay, so that is a thing that I think uh, will be one other thing we can talk about today. And this is actually related to what I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, that it will be related to the idea of Southern, you know, uh, authoring the Anthropocene, whether we can find other pluriversal uh, approach, you know, pluriversal ontological wording in order to allow different uh, multiplicity to emerge and, under, uh, and, and be able to, uh, you know, um, emancipate their own uh, encountering with Anthropocene. So, um, I think uh, I will start with Asuro first and then um, go to Maya, okay, and then um, Steve and Casper uh, later on. Uh, one of the housekeeping rules is that uh, you have 10 minutes okay, to speak and then uh, that will be the first round. And then uh, after the first round, if you have any questions, comments, suggestions you know, uh, that you would like to share, then uh, the floor will be open. Um, if not, then we can come back to uh, our speaker again. So Asuro, please. Thank you very much for a great introduction, Shakuit. And uh, also thank you everyone for arranging this wonderful occasion to be uh, part of this wonderful conference by uh, Prince Shinton Anthropocene Center. I'm very much honored to be part of it. So I'd like to talk a bit about, uh, about methodological challenges and changes that this uh, Anthropocene and the notion of pluriverse brings about. So as Jacquit said, that uh, very much central theme of today's uh, round table is about world making. And Anthropocene and Pluriverse both concern uh, uh, this uh, notion of world making. For one thing, Anthropocene uh, means that we, are, we humans are collectively remaking planetary environment by various ways but primarily by uh, CO2 emissions. In that sense, uh, now, if you like or not, we are taking part of world making, which is pretty destructive. And of course, there's a differentiated responsibility about that. And of course, uh, the North, including Japan, has a hugely responsible historically in terms of uh, accumulated CO2 emissions. But at the same time, as many southern or mainly Asian countries join this development race, and also uh, many countries, including Thailand, has, have been extremely successful in terms of development, now burden is a more less complicated and equally uh, forcing many shoulders, I think. So, so there's also a tricky part about the historical differentiation and current entanglement. That might be another story. But what I would, I'd like to uh, emphasize is that as long as you live in modern cities and use these energy intensive infrastructures, we are more or less uh, equally entangled in this uh, huge process of world making through material impact of CO2 and other emissions. So in my view, uh, this uh, fact of the Anthropocene 
leads to leads anthropology to a new potential and challenges, I think. So in the past, social sciences or science in general is supposed to be about describing the world. So it is our job to be objective and not interventive to describe what people are in a given community or whatever. But if everyone is involved in world making in one, one way or another, this kind of you know, detached position and assumption of stable world cannot hold. So the question has radically shifted in my view. And now the question is how we can engage in world making, which you if like or not, you have to be part of. And in this context, I think this notion of pluriverse comes in. And I, I, I'd like, uh, I want to particularly uh, refer to the book by, uh, by Arturo Escobar, who is also a very close friend of Marisol. Uh, the book is called Designs for the Pluriverse. So in that book, uh, Escobar strongly argued that anthropology has to shift from description to making world with others, including indigenous people, farmers, and so on and so forth. And uh, the book itself is a basically a design book. And in Japan, somewhat many designers uh, got interested in that book. And uh, we anthropologists uh, you know, repeatedly asked by designers to explain this idea of pluriversal design. But here, I think I see big shift. So in the past, anthropology is, more is about solely about description. But now, new anthropology that Escobar proposes is also, or maybe primarily, about making, remaking the world. And here, and this world is what you know, Escobar and uh, Marisol and Maria, uh, uh, Mario Blazer uh, commonly talk, uh, calls uh, pluriverse, a world with many worlds. And I think the question is that rather than rather the question is that how you can uh, utilize how you can reflect anthropological knowledge about diversity, ontological or whatever diversity and multiplicity, multiplicity into world making process, and how you can make many different worlds while being partially connected with each other and how this is possible, and how you can work with others. I mean, here I mean non-anthropologists, like designers, engineers, social uh, movements, and so on and so forth, in creating new worlds. I do think this requires you know, new emergent methodologies, which is the theme of uh, this conference. And, uh, and this would... Uh, totally transform anthropologists' position in relation to uh, those people who uh, we study. And in this context, I'd also like to point to another, uh, another concept developed by younger anthropologists called Adolfo Estelera and Thomas Criado Sanchez, from, both from uh, Spain. She characterizes this sort of shift from uh, describing other people to working together with other people in, uh, by the notion of experimental collaborations. So uh, in this context, anthropologists, becomes anthropologists and their interlocutors become more epistemic partners in the world. Uh, in their joint exploration of the situ problematic situation. And this, uh, so he, they proposes anthropology as making, uh, making things together with others. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. So I think, uh, and then I think we have a big question, I think. There have been many debates about anthropology's changing relationship with their interlocutors. So George Marcus and uh, Holmes uh, 
proposed this notion of parasite, and uh, Bill Moore and Casper and others proposed lateral ethnography, which is also b uh, based on uh, more or less horizontal relationship with interlocutors. And all these th changes has to uh, do with uh, the current uh, challenge of making other worlds possible. And uh, but uh, but still there is a lot of you know practical questions concerns here. So uh, remains here. So what actually you know what exactly anthropologists are supposed to do in order to work with uh, others in order to make things or make worlds and how yeah what is really necessary for us and it's it's a big challenge I think. So so far, anthropo what anthropologists have, uh, ans what anthropologists do is almost you know a story about writing texts. So we are good at writing, good at thinking, and all these things happens on paper pa on the pages of a book or an article. But if you work with designers, what you do would be radically different. And for example, I myself uh, taking part of uh, creating a uh, kind of sustainable uh, circular economy infrastructures in, uh, in Kyoto. And, uh, but this, this sort of activism requires not only writing and thinking conceptually. Of course, we do research for, uh, for the project. But at the same time, we have to take part of making uh, organization, making artifacts, making plans, making you know designs of infrastructures uh, for creating new uh, in order to change, for example, in this case, material flow of uh, products. So in that sense, you have to shift from writing to some sort of hands-on practice, which is making, in my case. But this is also a big thing to anthropology because in the past hundred years, anthropologists have been mainly writing. And uh, for example, most of anthropology department don't uh, accept, for example, artifact as a part of thesis. We are not like design department. But if we take this call by Escobar uh, for the design of the previous seriously, Maybe we have to think about anthropology taking part of making. And we have to take seriously about hands-on experiments or hands-on experience as a new modality of anthropological expressions. And I think here, uh, uh, you know, this uh, topic of this round table also relates with uh, you know, the emergent field of multimodal anthropologies, which you know, aspire for expanding mode of anthropological expression, you know, outside text, in not only films, but also making machines, making fab labs, uh, designing social uh, community space, and so on and so forth. So I think this requires big uh, expansion and transformation of anthropological methodologies. And I think this is good timing, timing to discuss this as this year is a uh, hundred years, you know, uh, as a celebration of the publication of Marinovsky's piece, uh, which was published in 1922 and marked the next hundred years anthropology. And then maybe it's time to think about new method at this historical moment. Thank you. So can we set the slideshow on full screen? I'm working on a Mac, so I hope this works. And is this how we, okay, great. All right, oh, let me just check and see if I can actually make this work. So, all right. Well, welcome everybody and thank you so much for coming. Um, thank you very much to Casper and Ajahn Jakrit for organizing this panel, and to Ajahn Komat and the wonderful people here at Surinder Anthropology Center for constantly being at the vanguard of multidisciplinary thinking about the Anthropocene and the more than human world here in Thailand. It's an honor to be here. 
So my talk today is going to think about a couple small but important questions that are related uh, to questions that um, Arturo raised about how world making and living together work. And um, so let me see. I'm going to start with a quote from Marisol de la Cadena that I find very generative and productive. And if I speak too quickly, please just wave at me, okay? Because I tend to. Um, so she writes, humans need to rethink the way in which we inhabit the human and its place in the history of the earth. They also propose to rethink the we. While this complex we is still composed of an us and a them, she says, they're both engaged in what Stengers calls reciprocal capture and partially connected time, place, while at the same time exhibiting not difference, but divergence, that is, what makes each of us be. Okay, so let me, I'm moving between two screens. Okay, so this complex we, uh, it implodes the possibility of a single idea of the self, okay, because it encompasses that which was traditionally seen as oppositional. And in that way, by considering divergence, and the, it makes us, forces us to think about the way we affect each other. So unlike the simple we, this complex we is heterogeneous and it, it is being a we or becoming a we with that which exceeds the usual. So it's more than the usual idea of we. And so the idea of divergence that she builds on uh, from Isabella Stangers is the concept that shows how practices exist within an ecology as they diverge in assertion of what makes them feel, think, and do. Unlike contradiction or difference, which require some kind of homogeneity in terms to compare or make equivalent, divergence constitutes practice in their heterogeneity, in their difference, um, as they become together, through each other even, while still remaining distinct. So like the example of the orchid and the wasp in the reciprocal capture example, there's an interest in common that is not the same interest. Practices self-make with others as they diverge in their own positivity. So I wanted to put those concepts on screen because I think an important part of what we're doing here is trying to find some touchstone ideas that we can work with together. Another concept that we've been working with in this group as we've been meeting and workshopping some ideas and sharing new thoughts about how to world make together is the idea of a contact zone, which Ajahn Jacqueline had mentioned a bit. Now contact zones, all right, are ambivalent spaces that intersect. Um, where multiple ecological scales um, and species meet. And there are places where this complex we could be recognized and enacted with care and attentiveness. I'm, I'm having trouble reading from that screen, so I'm gonna look at this one. Um, okay, so in this mo contact zone of complex we's, let's think about how subjects can be constituted in and by their relations to each other their co-presence are enacted in these contact zones, often within radically asymmetrical relations of power. So it's not all e equal or even or simple or nice. It's uneasy, sometimes uncomfortable, even sometimes dangerous. In ecosystem contact zones, we can identify edge effects, as Donna Haraway calls them, where assemblages of biological species form outside of their comfort zones. It is in these spaces that beings are relationally constituted and shared, but also contested worlds are made. So shared and contested world making, both. It's not just one or the other. Okay, so we looked at some contact zones recently. Um, one was a coral reef. This is what a healthy coral reef looks like. This is what a sedimented and unhealthy or dying coral reef looks like. And unfortunately, this is more of what the reefs that we were looking at looked like. 
um, another example of critical contact zones where we went yesterday on a wonderful tri trip is, um, I'm gonna say the name wrong, is it Bendakiti Park where a new rewilding project is taking place. So against the backdrop of this world making, I want us to remember the idea of the ecosystem and think of ourselves as humans, not as standing outside of nature, not as the masters of nature, as Western ideologies have often posited, not as knowledge as mastery, but as members of an ecosystem. The problem is we've stepped outside of our normal, usual, natural spot within an ecosystem. Now, you all know that the energy on the planet, to put it very simply, comes from the sun, through plants, into photosynthesis. Eventually, that's where we get our, our carbon, hydrocarbons and our fossil fuels. All of these exchange of energies in the ecosystem take place through a food web. And these are some different depictions of this web of life. Things eat each other, right? Life and the exchange of energy on this planet is about eating and being eaten. Yet humans, which are omnivores, we've stepped outside of the web of life and treat the entire web of life instrumentally in what philosopher Val Plumwood talks about as incorporation, that it only exists in relation to us to serve our needs and interests. And I would suggest this is a very profound distortion that is dangerous and problematic and leading to the kind of crisis that we are now in that some call the Anthropocene. Now, traditional models of sustainability, these are three very common ones, they're all problematic, right? Every single one of them is anthropocentric, and it sets the human at the center or at the apex, even though we're not apex predators at all. Now, uh, Christoph Ruprecht, a colleague of mine, uh, with a number of other colleagues, and I wrote a piece called Multispecies Sustainability, which proposed a broadened concept of sustainability that said basically, hey guys, your usual idea of sustainability isn't really sustainable unless you think sustainable means we can keep ruining the planet and taking and extracting as much as possible for as long as possible and never run out. But we know that if we do not attend to the needs of multiple generations over time, that actually cannot be sustained because we are reciprocally captured in ecosystems with other beings on whom we rely to live. So this other model that Christoph Ruprecht came up with shows a different way of thinking about humans and our co-created niches, which include cities that are not sitting outside of the web of life, but see ourselves as embedded in it. Okay, so basically what I'd like to let have us think about is the way in which our planetary life support systems are profoundly threatened by anthroposupremacism. Now that's a big mouthful of a word, but you know Anthropocene, you know anthropos is the Greek word for man, and I do say man because it was gendered. They did not really mean women or brown people or enslaved people or colonized people or laboring people or indigenous people. They really did mean the ruling elites, and that was the only part of man that counted for a very long time. Now we know this system was spread violently across the world through capitalism and colonialism, and that this has created profound and disastrous forms of human disturbance that Anna Singh has talked about in terms of feral effects. Now feral is another word for rewilded. It means something that has become wild, that is outside of control, outside of human control, right? Okay, so if our life support systems are inextricably more than human, and we can't really step outside of them, then we need to start thinking again about how to make the world in a different way. Anna Singh says that feral ecologies are ecologies that have been encouraged by human-built infrastructures. And those infrastructures then lead to feral effects that cannot be controlled, that destabilize the life support systems of the planet, okay? So I wanna just remind us that extinction is forever and that when we disrupt the biosphere, it's not just, oh, that's sad, this one little species disappeared, like a leaf fell off the tree of life. No, it's not like that at all. Extinction is forever in the way in which 
an entire branch of the tree of life. All the future possibilities of life are gone forever. So we need to think about how to decenter human agency in such a way that puts us back into the web of life as participants, not as masters or dominators. Okay, and decentering human agency partly means uh, taking new multi-species world-making approaches that understand that our survival is mutually entangled and entwined. All right, so I'm gonna skip ahead and say just a few words about this um, as I'm running out of time. Okay, so I want to propose that we cannot treat humans as the sole actors and agents of change. That we need to acknowledge and contend with the more than human agency. Uh, even, if, even as we must hold certain toxic anthroposupremacist modalities or forms or ways of being human and attendant systems of human activity, Activity, such as colonial genocide, slavery, systemic racism, misogyny, plantation monocultures, industrial capitalism, etc., and not say the novel coronavirus responsible for the mess that we're in and the destabilization of our planetary life support systems. Okay. So Let's think about the sustainability in a multi-species more than human world as symbiosis, which literally means living with other Earth beings, a complex we. And if we can ex think about this paradigm shift, then we can emphasize the irreducible ecological entanglement of human life with more than human agents and life forms. And think about how we could relocate ourselves into the multi-species trophic webs of life and intra-dependence that are within the ecosystems across biomes and ecoregions that are causing so many problems now. In other words, we need to learn to live with Earth beings differently, make worlds differently. And this entails an ontologically co-constitutive relationality. Okay, so let me jump ahead. And I want to just leave us with some thoughts from the post-colonial theorist Achille Mbembe, who wrote a beautiful epilogue to his critique of black reason where he reminds us of something that we should all know, but we often forget, and that is that there is only one world. In a world of many worlds, we still have to live together. He writes that humanity is singular, yet fragile, vulnerable, and partial, at least in relation to the other forces of the universe, the animals, vegetables, objects, molecules, divinities, Techniques, raw material, the earth trembling, volcanoes erupting, winds and storms, rising waters, and the sun that explodes and burns, and all the rest of it. And on this earth, he suggests a kind of ethos or ethic that fits, I think, with the complex we. It's an ethic of reciprocity. Um, so he talks about how to rename the world and ourselves in the world in a way that confirms the fragility of our worlds that we share with others, that confirms the necessary reciprocity that can only emerge from the difference between the world of humans when we acknowledge that the difference between the world of humans and the world of so-called non-humans is no longer an external one. Um, that in opposing ourselves to the world as our dominant ideologies, our mode of capitalist production and other forms of living so often do, we're actually opposing ourself. And for the, in the end, the only way that we can maintain the livability of the world is by manifesting the truth of our belonging to that world. And how we live with the world is how, he says, the truth of who we are is made visible. And he suggests a kind of metaphor from Edouard Glissant of what he calls becoming silt for one another. All right, I'm out of time. Basically. When we become silt for one another, we return to this web of life, and we understand that our being together on the planet is about, it's about eating and being eaten. It is about sharing a world that is difficult and necessarily complicated. And I will just leave it with the idea um, that Wendy Brown, a political theorist from my department at UC Berkeley, talks about that critique and crisis are inherently joined 
by the more than the necessity of asking novel questions to address urgent predicaments. Instead, we need to reground it in an explicit project of judgment. And I would say that we need to start judging new criteria for how we can live together as complex we, as multiple beings in a more than human world of which we are just one small part. Thanks. All right, thank you very much. Then uh, we'll quickly move to Steve. Thanks. Uh, 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 it's wonderful to be here, so thanks very much for, for having us here. Um, the title of this is uh, intended as a homage to Marisol's work and Marisol's work around mountains in Earth Being. Um, the phrase, thinking like a mountain, though, is also used a lot in the work of Michel Serre, and I want to to spend uh, the 10 minutes just talking about some ideas from Michel Serre's work. Uh, he's a French philosopher who passed away uh, in 2019, he's the author of an enormous amount of books. If you're not familiar with his work, I would very much recommend it. Um, to pick up on a couple of things that Maya was just saying, in particular two of her remarks about interdependency and the dis discomfort of interdependency. Interdependency is not a comfortable position. It involves tensions and conflicts. And the second remark that Maya was making about eating and being eaten and the extent to which life involves uh, what Sarah would call parasitic relations, that life itself is parasitic, that to live is to do damage to other species in some sense. And trying to work out how to minimize that damage that we do is, is one of the tasks. So Sarah, working in the sort of European philosophical tradition, there's a very old distinction between things that depend upon us and things that do not depend upon us. Um, one of Sarah's starting points is that's no longer an operative distinction. Everything depends upon us, that given the human spread around the globe, there is no aspect of the Earth's system that does not, in some sense, depend upon what we as humans do. However, Sarah also says... It's no longer within our gift to make that decision as to choose what depends on us and what doesn't depend upon us. It no longer depends upon us. It's not our choice that everything depends upon us. So we're in a situation of interdependency with all of that discomfort and not being able to choose not to be interdependent in some sense. So Sarah also talks about... We, we may have a mastery of the world, and by mastery, I think what he means by that is relatedness, interconnectedness, that we have those kind of unequal power relationships with a lot of elements within the Earth system. But the one thing we haven't mastered is our own mastery. In other words, our, uh, we no longer have a, a grip on our capacity to dominate and intervene in the world. This is something that Sarah, in a book of his called The Incandescent, calls panurgy. So this panurgic drive to master everything is no longer within our control. So what's the way out? What, what kind of route for thinking is there within that? Sarah also talks in the same book about something he calls the gardener illusion. And this is to think about uh, humans in time so Sarah says, if, if a flower, if a rose or an orchid could think, it would imagine that the gardener is immortal because the time scale of the rose or the orchid is so different, its duration is different to that of the gardener, that it has no sense that the gardener's own durations might be limited. Similarly, if a mountain can think, and for both Marisol and for Michel Serre, uh, mountains can think, but not in a way that we typically think about thinking. You know, the mount what would the mountain think about us? You know, it would see us as these, these tiny infinitesimal things that are gone in the blink of an eye. So trying to adopt the perspective of different kinds of durations and the tension that sets up between what a mountain would think of us and what we think of a mountain. Of course, a mountain is nothing in terms of the cycles of the Earth system. You know, mountains rise and, and, and fall almost in the blink of an eye for the Earth system. Trying to adopt the perspective of these different durations has this unsettling effect of thinking about how those durations fit with one another. And in Sayre's later work, he's very interested in what he calls the great story, the grand story, the entire story of the Earth system. How do we think of how humans fit into the story of the Earth system? Now, as a social scientist, I'm used to thinking in terms of 
10 years, 20 years, maybe 40, 50 years. We heard talk of Malinowski 100 years ago. You know, some social scientists can think two, 300 years. Can you think 10,000 years into the past, into the future? Can you think a million years? Can you think 600 million years? What Sarah asks us to think about as social scientists is we need to have those kind of durations as part of our stories. We need to think about how to fold in those massive time scales. And that is why I think it's interesting to listen to what Earth, Earth system scientists are saying. How do those things fit into the narratives that we want to tell? Let's try and give one example of that, trying to think about the narratives of, of COVID and other viruses. Um, uh, in the UK, that hasn't come out particularly well, in the UK, we have a terrible public health record, and I'm surprised you even allow me in the country, given what a terrible state uh, the UK is in. Um, to start, we had a, a slogan that said, stay home, protect the National Health Service, and save lives. It's an easy slogan because everyone, most people have a home, most people know where it is, so you know where to stay. You kind of get the idea that might protect a life and you kind of understand how that might fit into uh, in, in protecting the NHS and how that might save lives. However, that was, you can't really see it, that it was replaced with a slogan of stay alert, control the virus, save lives, yeah? Stay alert, what? What does staying alert mean? It's a psychological state, it's different for all of us. You know, I don't know what staying alert means. Control the virus? Control something you can't see or perceive that you only interact with when you're infected? How do you control a virus? And how does any of that add up to staying alive? Utterly meaningless, and hence the terrible state of the public health in the, in the UK. But what all that tells us is, well, how do you interact with a virus? Now, Sarah has this notion of panbiosis. We are related to all other forms of life, and we're related to all other forms of life because we have socialized every other form of life. We have cultured every form of nature, or in the process of culturing every form of nature. So we have to work out, if we're going to control a virus, it has to be understood in this panbiotic sense of what does control, what does safety mean in the context of a massively socialized nature? How does one control yet remain a part of the thing that one wishes to control? Now for Sarah, that kind of gives us some discomfort because our panergic drive to control everything, we always think in terms of controlling things, to us leads to panic because it's impossible to control those kind of things. One of the problems he says is that we no longer live with the things that we eat. We no longer live with the things that we relate to. And he has a somewhat, I think, nostalgic kind of view of, you know, kind of early farming as involving these affective relationships between farmers and the animals that they, they bred, where there was a form of communication because, peop because animals and, and humans lived together in a way that established that kind of communication. In a globalized world, there is no common hotel, perhaps as, as uh, Casper was punning on it earlier, perhaps as an uncommon hotel, but the, the idea of what it is to communicate with and talk to beings that we don't even really know how to perceive is, is part of what Sarah is trying to get at. Now for Sarah, that kind of living with involves trying to avoid appropriative relationships. Appropriative relationships, turning things into property, for Sarah is a sort of, almost a kind of byproduct of living, you know, but humans take it to a whole new level where we think about transforming what animals would think of as territories into appropriative property relationships. For Sarah, living with means standing aside, detaching oneself from appropriative relationships, thinking about how to have these non appropriative relationships, entering into kind of voluntary symbiosis, again, to pick up on what Maya was saying, Symbiosis itself is a strange term, it just means living with, and it includes parasitism. Parasitism is a form of symbiotic relationships, but there are other forms like mutualism, mutual benefit. So it's about exploring those different kinds of symbiotic relationships, which means sometimes being a parasite, but always sort of pushing towards being mutualistic. 
Oh, sorry, I should have uh, done my content warning first. Sorry, uh, I want to show you a picture that involves some uh, preserved rat corpses, so I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, I've become very interested in this notion of a, of a rat king. Uh, a rat king is a really strange kind of entity. It, it's um, rats, ratus ratus, it's the kind of incorrectly known as the plague rat, the black rat. It's rats that have their tails tied together. There are 61 of these recorded within Europe, of these rat kings that have been discovered. There's a big debate about whether they're real or fake, whatever that means, or real or artificial, I think. That's probably no longer an operative term for many of us. Um, what's interesting is they're found in these strange places often that went on to become Germany, Grosshausen, Wundersleben, Dolstadt. Um, so this leads some people to suspect that rat kings are kind of associated with geopolitics of territory. It's not, it doesn't seem accidental they're found in these quite contested kind of places. But at the same time, it's not just kind of rats that are tied together. There are other things tied together with the rat king. There are symbols, there are territories, there are relations between humans and rats. You know, rats are always found near human habitation. So the rat king is this strange thing that's both symbolic and natural. It's both other, that it's strange, but it's also close to us. Rats are always close to us, all of the time. Um, what I like about the rat king is, it's just, for me, it's a strange kind of figure of intelligence entanglement and of the necessity of that kind of entanglement. Entanglement we often take to be an interesting kind of way of thinking about it, but a, a way of thinking about multi-species relationships. But for me, entanglement is this kind of pain, this sort of desperation of living, that living itself has both this parasitic element and this symbiotic element to it, that, that living in its sense is both destruction and the hope and the possibility that we might escape that destruction. For me also, just finally, the Rat King is a sort of a, a figure of um, interdisciplinarity. Again, we think it, uh, uh, interdisciplinarity is a kind of a nice thing, an interesting thing. I think interdisciplinarity is just desperately, awkwardly painful <laughs> and horrific for all of us all of the time. But there's no alternative. We either live as a rat king or we die. Okay. Um. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so, uh, yeah, like everybody else. I also want to say thank you. It's so nice to be here. And uh, I don't know how well I can follow all these evocative comments, but I'll try uh, to resituate uh, some of them, maybe in light of this conjunction between the Anthropocene and Southern that is part of the title. Um, so just to go back a little bit to remind us of what we're talking about with the Anthropocene. In 2000, the atmospheric chemist Paul Crutzen and the ecologist Eugene Stormer coined this term Anthropocene to emphasize the central role of mankind in geology and ecology. And since then, the term has lived a tumultuous existence. Uh, let's see. Uh, to mention just a few examples from Europe and the US, the term has appeared in publications like The Economist, National Geographic, The New York Times, Time Magazine, not to mention a four-part television series by the English BBC, and the best-selling The God Species, written by the environmental journalist Mark Linus, which argued that the human species had to learn to use its supposedly godlike powers with wisdom. And I think it's both curious and instructive here, 15 years on, to observe the divergences geographical, disciplinary, but also conceptual, to which this term has given rise. On Western and Northern fronts, the Anthropocene tends to overwhelm the perplexed reader with hostile debates and starkly incongruent perspectives. So just for example, for Earth system science, which we've heard a little bit about, the Anthropocene names an objective planetary condition but then, on the other hand, for multi-species anthropologists and scholars in environmental humanities and, and elsewhere, that understanding is a reductive form of scientism that is blind to the coexistence of many kinds of more than human worlds. 
Meanwhile, Marxists argue that the Anthropocene is apolitical and papers over the colonial, the violence of capitalism and uh, colonial extraction. So it would be better to speak of the Capitalocene. But then conversely, some other anthropologists and geographers will argue that the Anthropocene in fact makes it possible to rethink politics in an ontological register. And again, many critics fault the Anthropocene for being arrogant and putting humanity on a pedestal like the God species above all other living beings. But others argue to the contrary that it's the first truly anti-anthropocentric concept which speaks to a totally new sense of human fragility and vulnerability, like says, uh, he didn't speak of the Anthropocene, but mastery, we can no longer master. Um, natural scientists will say, will turn the Anthropocene into a call to finally integrate all knowledge in social ecological systems. But then for others, like multi-species and ontologist people just mentioned, and I think it includes the panelists here in different ways, it speaks rather to the need for what could be called tickling collective intelligence. And in that sense, I don't think the collectivity of the intelligence, in that sense, I think it's quite fitting that I'm renamed as Katsuro because, I mean, it, it, it's thinking together about these things, right? And uh, Jack, Jack Ritt, but not only, because he's also Marisol here, I mean. Uh, so, so, yes. Um, um, so tickling collective intelligence. Um, from, the, from this latter angle, the question of whether the Anthropocene is an appropriate and adequate term recedes to the background because it's clear that it is not, but nor is any other team, uh, term appropriate. Uh, so that falls to the side, that question of appropriateness and fittingness. And so I think does the in incessant focus on perpetrators because it goes without saying in a certain sense that neoliberalism, extractive capitalism, imperialism, and settler colonialism are all awful. But rather than using the Anthropocene as a swear word, it becomes possible, as Catherine Jusoff, the geographer, has done, to write of it as a new password. Not a swear word, but a password. But to what? So I think that if the Anthropocene brings into view the increasing inadequacy of a lot of existing theories, tools, methods, and concepts, it's a password to rethink and construct new alliances and sophisticated conjunctions of knowledge and practice across a very heterogeneous cosmoecology. And I think this is in different ways what everybody have been speaking about. But here we have to slow down a little bit because while I refer to places where the Anthropocene proved controversial, Elsewhere, it failed to arouse a similar intensity of interest. In Japan, for example, uh, the uptake was much slower, and I think it was the same in Thailand. Uh, it's, of course, not that people weren't aware of many things happening to the weather or to the places where they lived, or even to more abstract things like climate or the environment. But the language and imaginary of the Anthropocene and the problems it raised so clearly in Europe didn't seem to work in the same way around here, for example. And that's no doubt for many different reasons. One aspect of the Japanese situation, which I know only a little bit about, Morita-san knows much more, may have to do with the Anthropocene reliance on a dichotomy between nature and culture, which isn't oper operative in, in Japanese language in the same way, and I doubt it isn't in, in, in Thai either. Now, of course, anthropologists have shown that dualism between nature and culture to be irrelevant in most places, except when it has been successfully exported from Europe and the US. But if one doesn't begin with an image of a pristine space of nature that's untouched by humans but later defiled by them, then the notion of the Anthropocene as a geology of mankind uh, that is radically different from what came before loses a lot of power. So, so far, I think we are in agreement with the Anthropocene critiques. But the critiques tend to stop there with the problems, all the problems of the Anthropocene. It's, uh, it's universalizing, it's westernizing, it's reductive, and so on. Or alternatively, they proceed to promote a different kind of master trope, like Capitalocene, which then becomes the, the sort of key to everything. And my view instead is that the Anthropocene could be fruitfully experimentalized and one way to do that is by pluralization, the pluriverse, and relativization. So with that, oh, move too quickly. We can, for example, put the Anthropocene into communication with a quite different password, Southern. Uh, Southern theory is the generic term given by Raven Collins to theory created outside the dominant Euro-American centers. Asia's method 
propounded by Yoshimi Takeuchi and taken up by Kwan Seng Chen later, provides an example. So Takeuchi's Asia's method began from the observation of a discrepancy between China as it really existed, in his words, and as perceived by the Japanese. Rather than comparing Asian forms of modernization to an extant Western modern for, form held up as an ideal, he argued that that kind of inter-Asian comparisons would be more fruitful for grasping our own, that is Japanese, positions within processes of modern subject formation. And later Chen elaborated by using different parts of Asia as imaginary anchoring points that would escape Western dominance. Um, to the extent that that project maintains an overarching duality between Asia and the West, I don't think it's particularly interesting. But a more subversive threat, in my mind, traces what Chen called minor to minor forms of lateral connectivity that would not route discussions through Europe or the US. So then Southern would mark all the possibilities that are opened up as soon as one st stops feeling the magnetic pull of always having to refer back to those centers. One can, for example, go directly from Peru, if Marisol had been here, to Thailand, or from Mozambique to Samoa, or Japan to Palestine. And after one has done that, it might no longer feel like the most pressing issue to beat or clobber the Anthropocene for its, for being, uh, for its universalizing and homogenizing closures and reductions. One could do many other things instead, including engaging differently with nor northern plural Anthropocenes. And that would be possible because the notion of a universal Anthropocene is already provincialized once you start by taking a southern route first. It would then be possible to consult English scientists and French philosophers like Serres, not as gurus or oracles or as enemies, but as positioned alongside others like Thai urban planners, Andean activists or Sri Lankan fiction writers, and of course also along Thai or Indonesian or Peruvian scientists and philosophers, all of whom are generating their own limited, variable and partial, in that sense, provincial Anthropocenes but they'd be interesting because they're provincial rather than being problematic for the same reason. Each of them generates an Anthropocene and an Anthropocene. Each of them are different. And we're then in a pluriverse, a cosmoecology of mutual complications and potential enrichments rather than one of denunciations and demolitions. So uh, the last minute here, um, So far, the referent of Southern uh, has been quasi-geographical, but given the need that I'm trying to paint here of, uh, for new cosmoecological alliances, it can also be given a more experimental inflection, different kinds, but for example, from speculative fiction. So uh, with that in mind, let me end by evoking uh, Jeff van der Meer's weird Southern Reach trilogy, which centers on a mysterious Area X that has suddenly appeared at an undisclosed location in the US and is surrounded by a wall of semi-permeable shimmer that you can see there from the Hollywood rendition shimmer. Uh, according to official explanations, Area X was caused by some kind of environmental disaster. In the early years, there were several military expeditions into the area, but they all went terribly wrong for unknown reasons. And indeed, what is so problematic about Area X is its unknowability and unpredictability. It is variably described as a transitional environment, but nobody knows what it is transitioning to, why or how quickly. It's described as a topographical anomaly that has created an entirely new kind of habitat by no longer operating according to the usual ecological vectors and rules of the game, again for unknown reasons. And it is described as an environment that presses down upon those who enter it or are next to it and manifests like a continuous low-grade fever and sense of dizziness. Not unlike, I think, the growing forms of COVID depression and climate dizziness and anxieties that are increasingly enveloping us in these years. Area X presents a situation, as one of the characters complains at one point, where our instruments are useless, our methodology broken. That's the same thing I started with 10 minutes or 12 minutes ago, because I think that situation is in many ways similar when it comes to ongoing changes on our planet. Southern Anthropocene then foregrounds questions of how to make the future livable under such strange conditions for different practical ontologies, 
sustainable for more than human worlds, and friendly to plural cosmoecologies. And in my view, at least, and I think it's, it seems to be shared here broadly in different versions, that requires sustained efforts at enhancing collective intelligence by reaching across differences of many kinds to invent better instruments, methodologies, and forms of politics, ontological, and otherwise. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, so um, we done the first round, so you start to see, you know, like pluriverse start to multiply, you know, in different directions. So, of course, I'm not, you know, the one who trying to, you know, uh, summarize and you know put it together because not that is not the purpose of this uh, round table. But actually, we uh, would like to open it up for the floor um, to, you know, have any kind of exchange or you know, comments or questions, um, you can direct to uh, any one of us or, you know, um, all of us as a whole. Yes, please, the floor is open. Yes, please. Um, okay. cup. Thank you very much for your presentation. It's very interesting. I'm um, also... Um, <coughs> following the subject of pluriverse as well. So um, my questions to you, maybe all of you can, can, can help answer this question, is that I see that um, on different ontologies and pluriverse has been said in a technical term, but I would like to see how practically it can be adopted in like um, as an anthropologist or like as a normal people living living in a like a normal situation, how do you apply that in, in real life practice? Because um, when you said about um, getting yourself back into the web of life, does it mean that we have to go back and live in like a primitive way while this globalization is happening, we're all connected already? Um, in practice, if we're like, for example, an urban people, not like agricultural, um, society, how, how do we kind of do that um, practically? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So are we going to respond um, one by one, or are we going to collect a lot of questions first and then... Yeah, so we, we, we do it now. So any one of you would like to respond for that? Um, I think Asuro also mentioned about you know, like uh, doing something with hand-on experience, right? And that kind of, you know, like practical hand-on experience also allow you to actually creating a pluriversal worlding, you know, so not only thinking about it uh, in terms of, of writing or classifying other people, other worldings, uh, but also having a, an intimate relation with your hands and your, you know, different kind of modalities of knowledge and, and experience, right? You, maybe you can also give example of what you are working on in Japan. Yeah. So I think one of key things, I mean, if you uh, allow me to be very practical, I think one of the key things about this uh, uh, pluriversal design is, you know, minimizing your environmental impact uh, by various ways of, you know, changing your life or changing your infrastructures and so on. And uh, everyone can, you know, experiment with that kind of thing. For example, uh, I what I recommend to do and I, what I did myself is a kind of, you know, building small uh, solar panel and a battery set, and you do, you know, your research or writing only using this, you know, DIY energy infrastructure. And uh, it's not about, you know, yeah. And uh, one important thing about this is uh, this sort of making and technical experiment can work as a sort of exploration of environment and infrastructures. For example, it's really hard to you know, do your daily work with uh, only you know, this uh, small size of uh, solar panel and a battery and charger. So therefore you learn a lot about you know, your energy consumption and also by using that you also become a more effective, uh, you, you can have more effective relationship with 
your environment, like sunshine, shade of building, uh, changing season, and so on and so forth. And uh, that kind of experience also learns you that, you know, uh, shifting to transition, uh, no, transition to sustainability is not really like just going back to, you know, before. And it is actually extremely difficult to, you know, uh, abandon urban life and going back to like lifestyle in 100 years, which is totally impossible given, you know, current technical, social, social situations. So you learn a lot about uh, complexity and difficulty in changing your life and your infrastructure. And I think, I think this is a, uh, many people including myself calls this as a critical making, which is a sort of mixture of ethnography and uh, DIY and design to explore social technical systems. And I think this also resembles in many ways uh, anthropological exploration of, you know, unknown world. And uh, yeah, so this is uh, my concrete example. Thank you. That's a really, I think, a really important question. Um, we intellectuals love concepts. Concepts are often very abstract. But at the end of the day, one reason that you're hearing phrases like lived experience, um, practice, uh, and, and um, you know, everyday life is that if we can't ground those ideas in new forms of order and organization of our worlds, then they remain these sort of abstract concepts floating around in our heads, but aren't actionable. So I think a couple of really um, basic examples to build on some of the things that um, Atsuru has said, um, we can think about the foundational building blocks of our everyday lives. Like I talked about eating and being eaten, so the question of where do we get our food and how my friend Timothy Morton has this phrase that I keep going back to, the how is the what. The how is the what. In this case, the question of how we get our food, for example, is it organized in gigantic monoculture plantations, which are machines for massifying life, as Zachary Capel calls it, or um, the breaking of generations, as Donna Haraway and Anand Singh talk about it, um, the radical simplification of life, so that the vast majority of the biomass on this planet are chickens, pigs, cows, soy, corn, wheat, and sometimes a little bit of rice. Um, that these kinds of processes, these are the how we do get the food that we need to survive um, is an important part of this solving this problem. Uh, so the radical reorganization of the basic forms of living, how we live with others. I think we do have to ground these big abstractions and these big ideals of becoming with and together. What does it look like in practice, in real everyday living and how we get our food? The eco-philosopher Val Plumwood talked about several modes of modern, what she called master rationality that she believed needed to be undone in order to actually transform the way we live. And um, I didn't have time to talk about all of those, but she talks about routes of escape from them. Uh, one of the things that uh, we were all talking about that Casper brought up uh, in some of our previous conversations were that reversal is not a solution. So it's not simply that the slave takes the place of the master or you know, that we just turn something on its head, but rather we need to fundamentally reorganize our relations to avoid five basic things. One, she says, backgrounding, the denial of our dependency on this world of others. We cannot simply flip the inversion, but we need to move to systems of thought and action, relations, accountability, and decision-making that recognize the contribution of those things that have been backgrounded and acknowledge our dependency in ways, re by or reorganizing the world in ways that reflect an acknowledgement of our dependency. So that would be other living beings that we depend on for food, for example, okay? Radical exclusion is another one of the moves of master rationality she talks about. 
So how do we undo master, the master rationality of radical exclusion in everyday life? Well, we have to think about our relational uh, differences and in terms of creating non-hierarchical forms of relationships with others that affirm continuity, reconceive our relationships in more integrated choice and break the false choice of the hyper-separation of us from them that is implied in, say, Marisol de la Cadena's complex we. We need to actually change the way we live in a way that reaffirms that we are connected in this. And then incorporation is the third category she talks about, which is a relational definition. Remember I mentioned the idea that humans as the master stand outside the trophic web of life. We think it, that the food chain exists simply to feed us, and that's problematic. So reclaiming, um, reclaiming the space, the, the intrinsic value of existence of those other beings, not just on whom we depend, but who exist for their own reasons, and accepting that in the way that we live is also an important aspect. And then denying the instrumentalism with which we deal with the world by trying to enact, inhabit, live, share non-hierarchical modes of difference that imply recognizing the other as the center of needs, value, and striving on their own account, and recognizing others as being beings whose ends and needs are independent of ours and need to be respected. And then the final one, homogenization, is thinking differently about those us-them relationships and enacting them differently in our daily lives. So that means recognizing the complexity and heterogeneity of others, whether they're other beings, other nations, all the othered others, um, and start stop treating them as these homogenized, you know, sort of false holes that make it easy for us to rationalize exploiting them. So we have to actually enact changes in our forms of life and order if we're going to actually make any difference. Okay. All right. So um, we can entertain more uh, comments. Just yes, please. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, allow me to ask uh, a naive questions, which I, I also ask myself these questions. Uh, can you please uh, tell us, or at least tell me as I'm a na naive person, uh, the difference between the uh, cultural relativism and the practicality of pluriverse? I mean, I'm, I'm not calling it the the, the ideas because it, you, you all talk about practicalities, right? But what's the difference? What's the nutshell of the distinctions between the ideas of uh, cultural relativism and the pluriverse? This might be too basic, but please. I mean, yeah, it's a it's a good question. There is a certain, certainly, a, as I use the word myself, relativity, right? And um, it's obvious that there are very many different kinds of perspectives. I think one of the crucial things uh, in the ontological terms uh, movement is it has to do with. Um, ground in a way the notion at least in western perspectivism and cultural relativism that well what is it you're having perspectives on you have many different perspectives on things out in the world and uh, so what was has typically been said to be the uniquely uh, scientific capacity of western science is to actually not have a perspective on it but figure out how it really is, right? You have a, you, like we say this a lot with sort of post-Trump politics and so on, everybody has an opinion, climate science don't exist, uh, okay, there, there's no, okay, but objectively speaking, it is like that because that's how the planet operates according to, okay? So, and um, 
I feel we're getting a lot of reaffirmations of objectivity these days because it seems very problematic that everybody has so many different opinions. But nevertheless, the idea of the ontological uh, assumption is then that it's not there. There is not no fixed ground there in the middle, and it's not because it is vanished as such. It's because what is at stake are multiple different kinds of not worlds but perspectives, not just discourses, but discourses built in to whole ways of being. For example, the earth beings. I mean, one of the pro I mean, Marisol's earth beings. I didn't mention that, but one of the problems here and I is that, well, I mean, the, the modern, modern ecological science uh, might, in a certain level, be in agreement with indigenous people that it's a problem if mountains are sold off and mined and exploded, right? you get destruction. But it's not the same kind of destruction because the problem for the ecologist is a loss of biodiversity, a loss of this and that and the third that's ecologically defined, whereas the loss for the Chiracuna is a loss of existence, uh, killing an earth being, which is that, that you have totally different set of relations. To the relations are not discursive. It's sharing food, it's being kin, and many other things. So, so that the fights, the, the relativity is in that sense about the composition of the of worlds and what can coexist and what cannot. And the question, when I, when I speak of... Um, cosmo-ecological alliances, that is one of the main issues I have in mind. It is, if you have this tri triangle there with people who want to mine mountains to extract resources, that's one set. Ecologists may want to protect mountains and, uh, and, and uh, Andean people might want to uh, live together with earth beings. Who can live together and have alliances here? Yeah? Well, it seems clear that the alliances would have to be the ecologists and the Andean peasants, although they don't share the same world. I mean, so there's the question of how to create possible alliances across really serious differences, not in not just in perspective, but in perspective and the composition of worlds. Like so, which worlds can coexist? They can coexist, but they have great difficulties coexisting with those who blow up mountains, right? And 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 so yeah, I think that is, that's the important one, and I think that's that's where, um, although the ontologies are different, so to speak, I mean the ways of understanding ontologies are different. That that's where the, there is resonance or, and affinity between ontological turns in science and technology studies, and in and, and as they have emerged in the uh, sort of Amerindian literature and with Marisol and so on, because it's the groundedness in much more than just discourse that is at stake. And in STS, right, with science and technology studies, that came in with, uh, once you started talking about actor network theory and non-human actors, it was precisely not social construction. It was construction of many weird things together that make a world cohere or not. Uh, and similarly, it doesn't have to be Latour, and it could be with the Donna Haraway, right? Cyborgs are also put together by many weird elements that can cohere or not. So I think across the sort of difference between that, that, that is really the central stake, uh, that if you don't have a given nature where somebody has the right to dictate what it is because they're Western scientists, then you have an exploded view where things become very open-ended and problematic. Um, and now we see uh, many consequences of how just how open-ended and problematic it's getting because one of the effects is that you can create many uh, anti-climate worlds also but you don't have the defense mechanism anymore of saying, well, but that's not objective. I mean, so you have to redo ways of composing a world without falling back on that because it still doesn't exist. I think that's a real challenge. Um, yeah. Just to add to that, because um, Casper made me think about uh, Donna Haraway actually has a response to specifically this question, which, by the way, is not at all a naive question, but actually a very difficult and important and, and central question. Um, so Donna Haraway's response was to talk about what she called the God trick. And some of you, I'm sure, have read her famous Situated Knowledges and Partial Perspectives article. Uh, in the God trick, she says, talking first about the sort of positivist uh, notion of uh, ontology and epistemology that came out of the Enlightenment. 
the idea of, that was the sort of God's eye view where you had no particular perspective, as Casper mentioned, and that you can see everything somehow all at once objectively. And that objectivity was pinned to being in that God's position, which she rightly mentions, along with many others, of course, we never can be and we are not. We, no one has the, the, that vantage point, um, whether you believe in God or not. It doesn't exist. So she says, we're stuck with partial perspectives. But then she says, but the view from nowhere is just as faulty as the view from everywhere. And she critiques other feminist thinkers and radical relativists and says that by completely throwing away the idea of objectivity at all and just saying, well, it's all subjective. You've got your position, I've got my position. We're a you know, world of myriad positions and we have no way to adjudicate between them. Um, she says that that's, that's just as bad as the view from everywhere. It doesn't get us anywhere. And so instead she advocates what I would say is a move towards an intellectual humility that says all we ever have is knowledge which is situated in practice and partial perspectives. However, the important aspect of this is that knowledge is not the property of an individual mind alone. It's always situated in the communities of people who share worlds, share speech, share action, institutions, organizational frames, and are embedded in what with one another and says, what if we replace the, the metaphor of that God's eye that sees all with the, the eye of a dragonfly, a compound eye that has all those different mosaic-like lenses? What if we think of a community of knowledge makers, plural knowledge makers who have different partial perspectives, different lived experiences, different situated realities, bringing their different knowledges together? Here, we're still not gonna get the God's eye view, but we, what we will have is some kind of intersubjective and intertextual grounds for making collective judgments about how to live together. And for, for Haraway, that's her answer. That's a kind of objectivity. And she says, maybe it's the only kind that we can have. Um, and we need to just throw away this antiquated, dis de destructive model of objectivity based in a God's eye view that no one can ever actually have which is connected to a false universalization that some group's particular experiences are somehow privileged with you know, the right real formula for how to be a person. If we get rid of all of that, step back and be a little bit more humble, realize we need to make knowledge together as communities who have different experiences. That's the only way forward. I think that's a good place to start. I, I agree that this is a very um, important question. Um, and I would like to jump in a little bit um, uh, of what I understand uh, from uh, you know anthropological debate. You know, when we talk about uh, cultural relativism, of course, uh, this is a very sort of debatable um, concept as well, right? It's not static, and it has been uh, refined and redefined for the past you know um, several decades. But then I think one of the distinction between the idea of reverse and, and, and cultural relativism is that um, cultural relativism um, is a kind of human-centric um, way of looking at the world. You know, just you know, referring back to what I quote Marisol uh, from the beginning of the talk that um, she mentioned that, uh, I mean, we're living in a one-world world, but just different culture. Right, so we, we speak different language. We are uh, uh, seeing the world differently, and 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 that shape our way of living. Um, you know, in, in this particular world, differently. But then um, the pluriversal idea is um, to allow the world to be decentered from the human perspective. For example, there are you know several books talking about more than human relations without human itself right so if I, for example like um steve talking about thinking like a mountain or the gardener illusion you know so that is how uh, the rose and the orchid look at you know, or even think about that environment how foresting for example or um another book by hannah knox you know, thinking like a climate for example so um it is very important how other uh 
actors or other um um you know uh living organism or even material see us uh within the world as well so if we are trying to sort of relocate the idea of you know looking at a uh, multiplicity or relativity of culture to the pluriversal uh, ontological politics for so the were mentioned about the level of analysis as well so it's not just the perspective uh, or epistemological uh, level of analysis but ontological level of uh, association you know um, among different entities in the world uh, so that is I think um, uh, uh, the idea of poor reverse. Um, and the other thing I mean we mentioned about this is I think uh, one other thing that um, Steve mentioned also that can you actually control uh, you know uh, the thing while being part of it and I think this is very important and related to probably um, what Asuro has been doing that uh, the relation of human with other things that we learn to be affected by others uh, actually allow us to be more humble in our way of uh, seeing the world. So um, I think this is very important because we always um, thinking through our own um, mode of knowledge or you know like sensibility. But allowing other things to actually shape us or seeing us and reposition our own. Uh, way of thinking and, and worlding. So worlding is not only the human um, uh, capacity, right? So it actually embedded in other kind of uh, entity as well that they be able to allow themselves to rewilding. You know, like we talk about the forest, we talk about other things without us. So I think this is a thing that Puriverse sort of trying to uh, gear off from the, the, the idea of cultural relativism. Any of you would like to add anything more? Okay, add you? Yes? Okay. Okay, yes, please. Um, thank you for the fascinating talks. Um, I'm thinking a lot and, and still thinking after um, the talk end. Um, anyway, I'm going to throw a mandatory question that you guys probably have confronted um, as in the advocators of this kind of encompassing um, ontological movement. So in the world, maybe in this country, that inequalities and um, human rights violation uh, are pervasive right now, um, probably there must be that I think you have confronted this kind of critique before that this kind of encompassing ontology that um, care for a lot of species, multi-species, somehow might dampen or overshadow um, the urgent and intimate problems that I am facing right now or other people around here are facing right now. Um, I think is a kind of question that allow you guys to to elaborate more how this kind of movement um, can be connected to this kind of urgent, still human centric <laughs> um, kind of problems. Just um, I think one thing I see from the talk is that okay, it's ontological differences. Uh, there's some ruptures between different ontologies. Um, however, I see that it has some kind of chronological differences between ontologies. Not everyone have the privilege to think about the time and life beyond themselves, and human's life is so short. Um, to be able to perceive the world that we share with so many species or even something that we cannot sense, um, yeah. How how yeah how 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 do how does this this kind of movement address um, those urgent problems that not everyone I don't know <laughs> are facing? Thank you. Chair, sure. thank you, thank you. Interesting question, and. Uh, for one thing, um, for my experience in field work, both uh, Thailand and Japan, I don't think uh, you know people, uh, unprivileged people, 
have less capacity to think about non-humans. I think farmers know a lot about water flow, fish and rice and other plant and plant species. And uh, compared with that, I think we, I mean people in academia or urban settings, has less capacity to know or interact with uh, non-humans, including, for example, rats in this building, for example, or mosquitoes and all these environmental things are less important for urbanites than uh, farmers or foresters. So in that sense, I think, um, uh, so in that sense, I think uh, the asymmetry is not, you know, about privilege of having time to contemplate on, you know, other beings, but it's more about your everyday practice and your own relationship with environment. And also infrastructure is a large significant force to shape this relationship. For example, we can have meeting in this room because of air conditioners and power grid that supply, constantly supply electricity to all these devices. And if you don't have this, or we have to do that, while ourselves uh, producing energy, you know, meeting might be very different, and we have to care a lot of different things while talking. And uh, so in that sense, I think, uh, it, I mean, relatively speaking, it is us that really need to know and take more seriously about non-humans around us. And also this is particularly important in this asymmetric, you know, power and wealth relationship. Because uh, me in urbanites in global south and people in global north are allowed to be not affected by my, uh, things around the world because of huge infrastructures that create huge environmental impact. And, all, and in order to run you know, electricity grid in Japan, for example, you have to extract a lot of coal from Australia and other parts of the world, and it creates huge tons of CO2s that basically submerging Southern Islands, like Maldives and uh, Pacific Islands. And also it's, you know, uh, uh, causing huge uh, coastal erosion in Thailand too. So in that sense, uh, this kind of being numb about environment is allowed by huge infrastructures. That is a driving force of, you know, uh, putting many people on the verge of, you know, difficulty, I think. So of course it is not only the problem. And the anthropologist has been looking at many different kinds of problems which are very urgent. But at the same time, there's a kind of more, not more, but there's another kind of you know, constant force of extractive capitalism has been working. And everyone uh, in the cities are kind of taking part of that through our own infrastructures. And this is, for me, this is politically very important anthropological intervention. Thank you. May I follow um, what Asro just mentioned? And this actually remind me of um, my encounter with um, uh, sort of ontology um, from the beginning, um, back like uh, 20 years ago when I started to uh, put myself in anthropology. And back at that time, uh, one of the key concern in Thai uh, anthropology and social science at large was about the social movement, right? Uh, ecological social movement, um, trying to sort of uh, bring up the voice of the people, you know, and, and allow them to be seen, to be heard uh, on one hand, and also talking about the, the e ecological justice for these indigenous people. Oh, okay, five minutes, okay. <laughs> Um, okay, I'll, I'll be quick. But then um, this led me to sort of interested in Taiban research. And I, I, I think um, they are still doing this um, uh, very important research uh, still. But then um, back at the time without this language, you know, to understand what Taiban um, research was actually is, um, of course they have been done a lot of research on how uh, indigenous people perceive and understand the world. But with a limitation because they only think about the Taiban research or the local knowledge just in terms of epistemological relation. So what they're trying to communicate, you know, the local knowledge through the policy maker is to turn the local knowledge into some, some kind of 
language that people can still understand. So those people who make policy, you know, and decision making can still be under understand this kind, of, you know, very queer or alternative way of thinking about the world. But there are a lot of limitation in Taiwan research because. Um, you have to translate, and you care so much about translating one of the you know system knowledge to another. But I mean, we talk a lot about partial connection. We talk about a lot about not not having the same common ground, but still be able to dialogue and, and digest. Uh, you know, um, other people's uh encounter with the world. So this kind of thing is. For me, uh, it's allow more sort of liberal, democratic way of thinking. Um, of course, it might overshadow something, and people might make comment whether this is uh, political, you know. But I, I, I don't think so. I think it's more liberal in terms of not only uh, allow uh, only one level of thinking. For example, methodology, you know, epistemology, ontology. But you'll be able to, you know, chip around um, the level of analysis and also bringing in different. Uh, people, environment, maturity into the consideration. So I think this is a kind of uh, um, so ontology is still relevant to the very urgent, you know, uh, concern of the people. Uh, but it is just I think it's just open the box for us to 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 explore. Yeah. Um, I think we have uh, only few minutes. Maybe um, any of you would like to have a final say about whatever things i think we've been talking a lot about different things but yeah since we're here and then this is uh uh i mean a lot of people interested in and may maybe later on they can you know um you know engage into this conversation just say something very quick now uh, maybe the, the person vanish who asked the question anyway anyway i was just thinking i think that one way there's been a lot of talk about in environmental worlds in a sense here yeah, and obviously that's very relevant because it's an uh, talk anthropocene and yet I mean the whole ontological discussion goes it goes beyond and it is is implicated with but not identical to all the environmental issues I mean worlds can be many kinds of things and uh, so I would say that if you're dealing with uh, uh, severe human rights issues, I mean, there are plenty, uh, many places around us. Uh, they can definitely be described in human rights language, but they can probably also be re-described and maybe enriched to some extent by uh, describing and analyzing in terms of the decomposition of whole worlds. Like it's not just individuals that are being violated or beaten or have their money stolen. It's their territories, so their, their infrastructures are breaking down, so they can't do things anymore. The, their livelihood opportunities are ruined because other species are dying or because uh, their environment gets trashed in some way and nothing viable is replacing it. So that being human is uh, being more than human. But it's also being more than environmental in that sense. I mean, the uh, the STS version of, of, of ontological thinking as co-constituted would say that we are in part shaped, for better or worse, by our air conditions here. I mean, and, and our taxis and train systems and our canals and our uh, ways of dressing and comportment and much else is creating the human so that there is no effective way of talking about Human, humans, people, and their rights without understanding the set of relations far beyond the individual uh, naked human body that, that, that produces who we are. Um, and so therefore I don't think there's any sort of um, opposition as such. I think it would be very, like, you, you, you can enlarge the, um, and, and the, the analysis, I think, by, by going that way. Not that you have to, but you could. And it's anyway just to say that I don't see it as a sort of encompassing uh, monotone and singular framework that requires you to do certain things only and not others. I think, I think it's a, there's a spectrum of possibilities for connecting various problems and interests um, with various forms of ontological and non-ontological thinking and that is in 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 the broader scheme of things that's what the alliances are about 
So I said it's about sort of figuring out who can be your allies without necessarily necessarily de- agreeing in all dimension on what constitutes the problem, rather than engaging in in the infinite set of uh, you know infighting that we uh, that we like a lot in the sociology and anthropology. Like I mean. Uh, you want you ontologist you marxist and you these people right and sort of the separating out there yes it's very important the divergences are very important but they can be turned into patterns of possibility to an extent rather than uh, you, you know the who can define what the only thing that truly matters for me that's very important these days because there's so much need for working uh, together on so many different things so, yeah. Is that, or you want to make it? Yes, okay. So maybe you can close first and then you make announcements. Okay, all right, thank you. So, um, I think you can make it actually. Uh, I think you can make it uh, because we have the information. So, well, I think we end of the session here. Um, so they can stop filming. So, uh, so I think we have coffee break after this. So if you still have any questions or comment, you can still uh, talk with our panelists. And thank you again, uh, Maya, Casper, Steve, and Asuro uh, for being here. And also, uh, yeah, thank you everyone for being here as well. And Maya, please, yeah. I just want to make a quick announcement. Oh, that's loud. Um, just for those of you who found some of these provocations interesting and something you'd like to continue on more, we will be posting a call for applications for 15 uh, participants for a workshop called Indigenous and More Than Human Ecological Justice Workshop Environmental Humanities Research in the Global South that will be hosted, organized by RCSD, my Amr Mundi Multispecies Ecological Worldmaking Lab and the Integrative Center for Humanities in- Innovation at CMU from the 15th to 19th of September. And so if you're interested, um, we will be posting on Facebook about this and send out the call for graduate students, young scholars, or people for whom these are new methods. And it will be looking at multi-species ethnographic methodologies and Taiban approach, how we can bring them together to actually do investigations of these things, looking at struggles for justice under the Anthropocene in conditions of the global south. Um, and we'll be looking at them in site-specific context in relation to the feral effects of dams and hydrological water diversion infrastructure projects on indigenous, marginalized, and more than human communities. So um, who are, uh, live along the rivers or areas subjected to deforestation and human disturbance through development. So if you're interested, come check it out, ask us, and we'd love to invite you to apply. And thanks again to the San uh, Anthropology Center for always being at the cutting edge of these kinds of events and for bringing us here. Thanks.